Good morning, everyone, and Happy New Year. Um, I want to welcome all of you, and uh, thank you for uh, joining us uh, today for today's educational webinar titled Alternative Investments and Self-Directed IRAs, What You Should Know. I am Manzu Gaucher with the Entrust Group, uh, your host for today, along with my uh, special guest, uh, Lauren Hager, uh, Vice President of Fenex. Um, we, uh, we have a lot to cover today, so I'm going to get uh, right to it. I'll start with a brief overview of the Entrust Group, uh, who we are and what we do, maybe talk a little bit about uh, self-directed retirement plans and how they work and then hand it over to uh, Lauren for his part of the uh, presentation. After which, uh, we'll open up for Q&As. So I encourage uh, each of you to uh, type in your questions in the chat box, as you can see there below. And we'll try to get to all of these uh, questions at the conclusion of the uh, presentation. So a bit of a disclaimer that we're required to read out loud to you before we start. The Entrust Group, Entrust does not provide any investment advice or endorse any products. Uh, all the information and materials are for educational purposes only. All parties are encouraged to consult with their attorneys, accountants, and financial advisors before entering into any type of investment. So um, a little bit about the Entrust Group here. For those of you that are unfamiliar with, um, with us, we're a leading provider of uh, self-directed retirement plans. Uh, we've been in business for over 30 years, managed nearly $4 billion in investor assets. And what we've done is exclusively concentrated our services for those past 30 years on the record keeping and administrative uh, administration of truly self-directed retirement plans. Um, you know, we strive to give our clients maximum flexibilities to unlock their retirement funds so they can take control of their future by investing in what they know and understand and investing in alternative assets such as real estate, private placements, hedge funds, limited partnerships, and so much more. We don't provide any investments uh, or advice. We simply do the record keeping for the self-directed IRAs and provide education through our uh, national continuing education program to uh, professionals such as realtors, CPAs, attorneys, and through the many webinars that we provide and live presentations to our individual investors. Um, so again, a little bit about me. Uh, I'm uh, Manzu Gaucher, the Business Development Manager for the Entrust Group. You can see a little bio on me here. Um, I've established this, uh, this Los Angeles branch about 10 years ago, actually, overseeing um, thousands of self-directed transactions for my clients and providing education to professionals and individual investors. Uh, Lauren Hager, again, I'm delighted to have him with us as my guest speaker. He's the VP of uh, Phoenix, uh, a private securities marketplace for qualified investors. I'm sure he, uh, when he comes on, he'll tell you more about himself and, and Phoenix as well. So the agenda for today is as follows. Um, I will go ahead and give a quick overview again of self-directed IRAs, talk about the benefits of um, investing in alternative investments with a self-directed IRA, hand over the, uh, the mic to, uh, to Lauren. He'll be uh, talking about Phoenix, the landscape of the alternative market, what is an accredited investor, um, general solicitation, the JOBS Act and crowdfunding, challenges faced by the alternative in, in alternatives investor, sources for alternative investments. Uh, all very, very uh, educational, insightful information that we're all looking forward to hear from uh, Lauren today. So just quickly here, kind of go over uh, what is a self-directed IRA? And then we get this question all the time. And simply stated, it's an industry term for an IRA that invests 
in non-traditional assets, such as real estate, uh, private stock, precious metals, etc. It's not a type of IRA, it's just a term. So at many times when we get individuals, um, you know, investors contacting us inquiring uh, what type of IRA or box they should check on their application paperwork that they have for interest when setting up an account, and they're looking for that box uh, that, that says self-directed IRA, you know, they see the traditional, the, the SEP, the simple, the Roth, but, but they don't see the, the self-directed IRA, and, and there is none. Um, again, any type of retirement plan that you have with interest by default becomes a self-directed IRA. Again, it's a term, not a type of retirement plan. So if you have a traditional IRA at a Schwab, you transfer it over to interest, now it becomes a traditional self-directed IRA. If you have a Roth IRA at, uh, at Bank of America, you transfer it over to, to interest, now it becomes a self-directed Roth IRA. And a self-directed IRA allows you to expand your investment options. It gives you the flexibility to diversify your retirement portfolio uh, by investing, again, in all types of allowable assets, not just the traditional investments such as stocks and bonds and so on. The IRS, as a matter of fact, uh, just lists a couple of disallowable assets that your IRA may not invest in namely antiques, um, S-corporations, collectibles, life insurances, everything else you may. You're not locked in into uh, limited types of investments offered by banks and brokerages. Again, um, traditional financial institutions offer you a limited menu of products. Um, with a self-directed retirement plan, you're not limited by the parameters set up by the, uh, the custodian for you, and you get much more greater flexibility in the number of uh, investment choices that you may have. And again, it's regulated and governed by the same rules uh, of the Internal Revenue Code, because again, a self-directed IRA is just a term, not a type of IRA. So what are the reasons for choosing self-direction? I think the biggest advantage for choosing a self, truly self-directed retirement account is the ability that affords you to fully diversify, to be able to invest not just in traditional assets, again, just as, just, uh, such as uh, stocks and bonds and et cetera, and also in alternative investments, as we mentioned, such as real estate, private placements, limited partnerships, hedge funds, precious metals, and many more. So it's really about leveraging your knowledge and uh, investing in what you know and understand. And in saying that, um, so again, here with us today to share his insight on alternative markets is Lauren Hager of Phoenix. Lauren, welcome. Thank you. How are you today? You. Good, good. All right, well, good to have you, and uh, the mic is yours. Great. Thanks, Munzer, for the introduction. So Munzer gave you a, a great uh, introduction on why uh, self-directed IRAs make sense from an uh, investment vehicle perspective and uh, the flexibility included with uh, that uh, means of investment. So, you know, it makes sense that the next question would be, well, this is great. You know, I can do a, a self-directed investment in a variety of different uh, verticals, how do I find those investment uh, possibilities? And so that's what I'm here to discuss. So I'm with Finex. We are uh, the private securities marketplace. We are an uh, online platform for a distribution of private offerings from uh, investment banks and fund managers, and, as well as uh, managed futures account um, providers. And so we'll, we'll walk through that a little bit um, in a little bit, but I want to walk you through the uh, current regulatory uh, changes that are uh, have taken place over the last year, as well as the the private um, capital market as well. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about uh, the private capital market. Every uh, last year, uh, there was an inflow of 1.7 trillion dollars through Reg D offerings. Now, Reg D offerings include uh, private stock offerings and operating companies, 
uh, hedge funds that operate under Reg D, bringing in investors into uh, investment funds that uh, do not operate under the uh, Investment uh, Company Act of 1940. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and right now, all of, the, all of these investments are done in an ad hoc fashion. And so, so what we mean by that is that there's no real exchange for these type of investments. You can't uh, go on to a Schwab account or an uh, E-Trade account and invest into a hedge fund or a privately held operating company. All these transactions are done uh, either by the companies themselves or done by investment banks. This means that the, the cost of uh, a, a transaction is much greater than it is uh, with a, a typical uh, public offering or a mutual fund or uh, any type of readily accessible, uh, accessible uh, investment uh, vehicle. So uh, a couple of changes uh, have occurred in the last year which are alleviating these problems, and, and uh, we're going to walk through that as well. Okay, so one important thing to know about these uh, uh, investment possibilities is that, the, is that they are only available to what's called accredited investors. Now, accredited investor is a defined term uh, stated by the um, Securities Act of 1933. It means that an individual investor has uh, more than uh, $200,000 in income for the last three years uh, and uh, has a reasonable expectation of making more than $200,000 this year, or their uh, marital joint income is $300,000, uh, has been $300,000 for the last three years and has a reasonable expectation of uh, matching that this year. Or you can have a net worth exceeding $1 million individually or jointly with your spouse. Uh, and additionally, you can participate in private offerings if you are uh, an officer of the company conducting the offering. Uh, not really applicable to the deals that we're uh, discussing today, but uh, you know, when you see these uh, companies that are going to IPOs and you see that uh, people are making a large sum of money from uh, investments that they made in early stage companies that they're uh, uh, working for, this is how that occurs. So it's important to note that you know, these are relatively large figures, but this includes uh, uh, estimates, uh, uh, there's a range of estimates, but uh, typically around 6% of the American population. So we're, we're contemplating uh, uh, you know, a fair amount of potential investors that could participate in, in these type of offerings. Uh, but that said, only 2.7% of, uh, of accredited investors participate in private offerings on a yearly basis. And that's because of these, uh, these challenges. These groups have no efficient means to sell or market their products. Uh, prior to the Jobs Act, Groups cannot advertise private offerings. They could only discuss the offerings with individuals that they had previous relationships with. Um, today, alternatives are sold in a very time-consuming, manual, and expensive way to really only institutional buyers and family offices. So since it's, it's expensive to develop relationships with potential allocators into private offerings, uh, investment bankers and individuals that participate in these type of offerings really only focus on traditional allocators in this space. And that means large institutions such as uh, uh, foundations and uh, family offices, insurance companies that uh, participate in these type of offerings on a uh, regular basis, as well as uh, private equity groups and venture capital groups that uh, also participate in these type of offerings. So this is a, this is a very small universe of uh, potential allocators. Uh, the market is uh, traditionally slow, as I just discussed, and opaque. So we don't have a very good idea of uh, what the valuations on these firms are and uh, how much is actually transacted because of the reasons I just discussed. It's a, it's a very self-contained world, and it's difficult to penetrate. Uh, so traditionally, there hasn't been a single platform for sourcing private placements, hedge funds, or uh, managed futures. And that's because it's been done in this ad hoc fashion with only large institutions. Uh, working with investment banks. And as I said, less than 3% of accredited investors participate in these type of offerings. Okay, so what's, what's changing? General solicitation, it's big, big change. So 
for the last 80 years, uh, investment banks or anyone conducting a private offering has not been able to advertise it. They haven't been able to distribute it beyond the people that they already know. So as of a couple of months ago, uh, people that are marketing private offerings can advertise. Big change. So to do so, they must register with the SEC, um, and they can still only work with accredited investors and institutions. So there's a little bit of regulatory risk here. Now, the SEC is really still figuring out what it means to generally solicit for investors, and they're working out the kinks uh, in real time. And so there's some pretty strong uh, pro prohibitions against general solicitation unless you make the appropriate filings, uh, including that you cannot raise capital for 12 months uh, after ge general soliciting without uh, filing appropriate forms. So some, some groups are still very wary of this process because they see uh, an SEC that's figuring out the process as it goes and some strong uh, prohibitions against making mistakes. So currently, few groups are uh, participating in general solicitation, uh, and most of the groups that are are small startups that are working not through investment banks, but they're doing their own capital raises. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about crowdfunding. Now, crowdfunding is, I'm sure, something that uh, you've heard about or will hear about in, uh, in the short future. Um, to run a crowdfunding raise, you have to work with what's called a crowdfunding portal. Now, crowdfunding portals are somewhat like investment banks. It's a, it's a lower threshold to uh, membership in FINRA, which is the uh, Financial Industry Regulatory Authority, uh, but it has to operate through a portal. So typical Reg D capital raises, you can work through an investment bank, you can conduct it on your own. Uh, crowdfunding raises, you have to work through a portal. You can raise up to $1 million in any year. And uh, currently, globally, the market size for crowdfunding is anywhere between $2.7 billion and $5.1 billion. So you, know, you may ask yourself, well, you know, Kickstarter is doing all these raises. You know, isn't that a large portion of it? And the answer is yes. So you know, how much of it is equity? We don't have a, a, a firm answer on that, but estimates range in between 15 and 20% is actually uh, equity crowdfunding in uh, jurisdictions that have already uh, adopted uh, similar type regulations. So quite a few restrictions on, on crowdfunding. Uh, individual investors, not accredited investors, can only invest uh, $5,000 if their net worth is less than $100,000, um, or 10% of their net worth uh, if they have, er, uh, yeah, 10% of their net worth if their net worth is above $100,000, um, or 10% uh, of their annual income if their uh, annual income is above $100,000. Now, that may sound a little bit confusing, and that's because it is. And the SEC is still figuring out whether this is an either or or an and type situation. Uh, and they're trying to figure out exactly how much people can invest. And currently, there's not a very good way to track uh, crowdfunding raises and determine whether investors are actually limiting themselves to uh, the amount that the regulations enable them to participate in. So there's, there's, again, a fair amount of regulatory risk here because if you have an investor that's going around and investing five or $10,000 uh, in several investments and that brings them over their threshold, there may be a threat of uh, winding down the raise because of uh, non-acceptable uh, participants. So additionally, investors must be given educational resources regarding investment and private offerings. That's pretty straightforward, uh, but there do, does need to be education provided uh, to the investors so they have a good idea of what they're participating in prior to uh, executing transactions. One second. Okay. So what are the positives and negatives of crowdfunding? Uh, in short, 
this is a new means to source capital. That's a good thing. Uh, obviously, we've had some difficult, uh, uh, a difficult climate for new businesses throughout the last uh, five or six years. There's been uh, a decrease in bank loans uh, and uh, uh, small business loans. So it's been uh, very difficult to uh, gather the necessary capital to launch new businesses. So this is a, a good means for uh, uh, creation of jobs through uh, creating small businesses throughout the country, or at least that's the hope. On the negative side, uh, if you have a crowdfunding raise, there's a potential to have a large number of shareholders, which means that you have a large reporting um, requirement that may be a financial drain on your resources on an ongoing basis. Uh, additionally, if you have a, a $1 million raise or a $750,000 raise, um, you do have uh, audit requirements that trail for a number of years that are um, very costly as well. So at the end of the day, the cost of conducting a capital raise may be uh, uh, large enough that it's really not an efficient way to bring in capital. You know, and from the investor's perspective, uh, you know, the positive is that you get to uh, participate in a lot of startup opportunities that you would not be able to previously. So for non-accredited investors, there is an opportunity to participate in private offerings, whereas prior to the Jobs Act, there was not. Uh, addi additionally, you know, there is a, a layer of fraud vetting here uh, because there is a wide dissemination of these offerings. There is an opportunity for uh, investors to pool their diligence resources and uh, uh, determine whether there is a fraud taking place. Uh, additionally, there is, of course, the, the possibility that there is a you know, a home run investment here that uh, you know, starts out as a small raise and goes on to become a big company. Uh, and the, the negative is the opposite side of that equation. So most of these businesses are going to fail. And so it's a high risk, you know, potentially high reward situation with very low liquidity. So these private offerings, uh, you cannot buy and sell your stakes very easily. And even a successful company, you may be stuck in that company for a very long time. Okay, so how do you find these investment opportunities? So these alternative investments can be divided broadly into three categories. Uh, primary issues, which is what we've been talk talking about, um, either crowdfunding or Reg D offerings. Um, sources include AngelList, Finex, Gust, uh, and a, a variety of uh, portals out there that are doing these type of um, offerings. Secondary, these are still private offerings, but these are uh, private offerings that have passed their restricted lockup period and now can be resold to uh, other individuals. So think of it this way. Prior to Facebook's IPO, there was a large number of Facebook employees that were interested in selling off some of their shares to uh, uh, you know, have a little bit of liquidity. And that's uh, really when you saw the growth of uh, companies like Second Market and Shares Post that served as a clearinghouse for uh, private shares. And so that's still going on. Uh, it hasn't been as much of a vibrant market since the, the big social media uh, companies had their IPOs, but there is uh, still an opportunity to participate in that manner. And then funds. And so hedge funds, managed futures accounts, uh, participate in capital markets through this uh, vehicle as well. And you can find these opportunities through your registered investment advisor. Uh, some brokers have access to this, and then, of course, Finex does as well. Okay, so how does this process work? So if you, if you are working with an RIA or a broker, uh, you can discuss your interest in alternative investments, and they can show you the investments that they have available on their platform. So uh, if, you, if you do have a RIA relationship, they probably have relationships with a, a fair amount of hedge funds and managed futures accounts uh, that you can participate in in a pretty uh, easy manner. If you're a self-directed investor uh, and you're using a uh, discount broker, uh, you're probably going to need to find someone that uh, specializes in alternative investments. Um, they'll have you go through a suitability analysis to determine whether you should participate in these type of offerings. Uh, and then uh, make you declare that you are, uh, in addition to being capable of participating in these type of offerings, you understand that there is an additional risk uh, and you're willing to uh, assume it. 
So as a customer of interest, you're already you know, one step uh, on this process. So you can find investment uh, possibilities, and then you can uh, work with interest to do it uh, through a self-directed IRA. Okay, and for additional information about uh, what we do at FinEx, I encourage you to go to our website, and you can see some more information at the URL that's included here. Great, Lauren. Um, thanks so much. That was very informative and uh, very educational for our for our clients and, and uh, listeners out there. And yes, we see a lot of our clients interested in investing in uh, you know alternative investments, and that's what we do. Uh, one thing we do not do is is give any investment advice or any of that sort. Uh, clients come to us again with an investment in mind, and and they decide if that's what they want to invest in or not. A um, couple questions uh, that have arised here, and uh, we're going to pose them to you, Lauren, uh, before we conclude here. Um, just kind of, what are the typical investments for projects on Phoenix? Kind of, uh, just a big yeah. picture. Great question. So we we deal with quite a few different uh, investment verticals. So Finex serves as an aggregator of uh, investment opportunities from a number of in, uh, investment banks and fund managers. And w what I mean by that is that Finex itself doesn't operate investments. Uh, we work with uh, other investment banks that are already in the business of conducting capital raises for private companies, as well as fund managers that operate hedge funds and private equity funds and uh, any number of different uh, private investment verticals. And so at any one time, we'll, we'll typically have uh, you know, uh, anywhere from 50 to 100 offerings, and it ranges from uh, early stage companies conducting a 3 to $5 million uh, investment round to established companies looking for acquisition capital to uh, emerging hedge fund managers with uh, niche strategies uh, to larger hedge funds that are uh, always raising capital. Uh, and then additionally, managed futures uh, providers that are doing uh, commodity strategies or index strategies or any number of um, uh, market neutral strategies that may be an interesting way for you to uh, hedge your portfolio. Very interesting. And, and another question is, uh, how would one become a member of Finex? It's very straightforward. You can go to finex.com uh, and click on Sign Up. We'll ask you some very basic biographical information. And then um, you can certify your request. And after you have uh, stated that you are an accredited investor, then you can go on and see deals. And then this whole process can be accomplished in about three to four minutes. And then feel free to give us a call at Finex, and our information is on finex.com, and we'll be able to uh, lead you through the process and uh, put you in touch with any bankers that have uh, uh, offerings that may be interesting to you. Right, and obviously a lot of these deals, they could be uh, uh, purchased through a self-directed IRA as well, right? Of course, of course. Yes. Um, there's a question here. I'm interested in purchasing mobile home parks. I would like to get in contact with SDIRA investors. Um, uh, Gunnar, uh, just please call me uh, directly on this question that doesn't pertain to this uh, webinar. Um, Lauren, one more question. Uh, so do you work with REAs, or, or who do you work with? We work with uh, quite a few different types of investors and uh, service providers to investors. So we do work with um, individual IAs that are trying to source alternative uh, uh, investment vehicles for their clients, as well as RAs that are looking for new funds or products to put onto their platform. So, uh, yeah, we're, we're always open to talking to RIAs uh, about uh, you know, sourcing investment possibilities for them, as well as putting their clients onto our platform um, so they can source independently, uh, but then rely on their investment advisor for uh, assistance and advice going through the investment process. Great, great. Well, I'm sure some of our listeners out there would uh, have some questions for you in the near future. Could you uh, please just give us your uh, full contact information, how they can reach you, and so on? Absolutely. Uh, I can be emailed at lhager at finex.com. That's L-H-E 
G E R at Finex, F N E X dot com. And I can be reached by phone at 317 468 9899. Again, that's 317 468 9899. Great. Thank you so much again, Lauren. And again, for any questions as far as Finex and alternative markets, uh, feel free to contact uh, Lauren uh, directly. As far as any questions you may have regarding self-directed IRAs, how they work, and, and, and so on, here's my contact information. Uh, my email is mgoshe at theentrustgroup.com. Direct phone number is 310-496-4216. Uh, so again, I want to thank um, first uh, Lauren for joining us today. Uh, it's very informative and very educational uh, presentation. I want to thank all of you listeners out there uh, for joining us today. Hope to see you and, uh, and, and have you a part of our upcoming uh, webinars. Thanks so much. Have a great day.